Good morning and welcome. Sorry for the late start. Uh, glad you're joining with us on this Independence Day for our second service on Sunday morning. We have two services, the first of which is the Prophecy Update, and second is our verse-by-verse -verse study through the Word of God. We currently find ourselves in the book of Hebrews, and today's text is going to be chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. So for those of you that are here, if you're there already, if not, I'll invite you at this time to turn there. And if you're able, uh, please stand. You can follow along as I read. If not, where you're seated is fine. The writer of Hebrews, by the Holy Spirit, verse 12, writes, For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing, verse 13, in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before, his, before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. Therefore, verse 14, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then, verse 16, approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let's pray. If you would, please join with me. Loving Heavenly Father, thank You so much for Your Word, and especially this portion here before us today. Lord, that's why we're here today. We're here because we want to hear You speak into our lives as only You can in that still, small, refining voice, very personally, very powerfully, if need be, confidentially, just between You and us, as You minister to us and reveal to us that which You would have us to see in this passage today. Lord, please, will You speak? Your servants are listening. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. So I want to talk with you today about one of the most powerful passages in all of Scripture concerning God's help in our time of need. I have to confess that actually this was deliberate. Before I took a couple of weeks off, I deliberately stopped at verse 11 in chapter 4. I'm sorry. You're not upset with me, are you? No, I was saving the best for today. Verses 12 through 16. And I have been so looking forward to this well-known text that we have before us today, and this because of the profound impact it has had in my own life. God has used this particular passage of Scripture over the years in ways that only He can to minister to me in those times when you just cry out to Him for help. Help, Lord, help. There is just chock full within these verses, promise after promise to us from our 
high priest. And this is important. We're going to talk about this in a moment. What follows are three ways, and actually in order, that God, who, as we just read, empathizes with us, first reveals the problem to us, sort of a diagnosis, so as to be a help for us. And the first one is where it should be and where it all starts, and that's God's Word in verses 12 and 13. Now, sadly, for many a Christian, what the writer of Hebrews says here has been met with misunderstanding at best and confusion at worst, and I'll explain what I mean. God's Word is sharp. It's sharper, actually, than any double-edged instrument or sword. But not in the way you might imagine it. It's not God's Word being sharp to cut us into pieces. No, it's God's Word being so sharp and with surgical precision to get to the heart of the matter. And He does this, again, as only He can, to show us us. Again, let me explain. The Word of God, James says, is likened to a mirror. We search the Scriptures, but truth be known, the Scriptures are searching us. We examine the Scriptures, but truth be known, the Scriptures are examining us. And it's, to borrow a medical metaphor, it's like we go in for an examination because there's a problem. And we need to diagnose what the problem is so we can treat it. So we go in and x-ray, uh, what's those machines that they say, not, what is it? MRI. You're not supposed to do that, right? Aren't they bad or something? Anyway, I'll stay in my lane. So they, oh, how about this one? Ultrasound. You know, they have the, the really high-tech ultrasound. You, you see everything, more than you actually want to see, actually. <laughs> but you go in, and they're going to now do an examination. And we've got, we got to see what's going on. And this is what God's Word does. God's Word is like that ultrasound, that MRI, that x-ray, and it shows us, oh, look at that. First service today, um, had the privilege of meeting some visitors from Macaquilo, precious couple. Guy introduces himself to me. He said, we've been watching you online, and my wife and I just wanted to meet you, and I just wanted to share with you that I am a miracle because I had esophagus cancer, and they gave me six to ten months to live. I was a dead man walking. And he said, and he pulls out his phone to show me the pictures. And here's this color image. And he said, you see that glowing there that it looked like a, you know, like a light, a spotlight? He said, that was the cancer. He said, here's the sw swipe, you know how you see it? So I swiped. The next image, gone. He said, they were just stunned. I love it when God does that. He completely healed him. But that, that was the problem right there. That's it. And that's what the Word of God does. It shows us the problem. Now stay with me on this, because this is really important. God's Word delineates between the emotional and the spiritual. It divides, cuts, separates the soul from the spirit. What does that mean? The emotions from the spiritual, the emotional from the spiritual. Only God's Word can do that and pinpoint that with precision and perfection. Because a lot of times, especially when you're going through a very difficult time, the emotions can take over. Nothing wrong with having emotions. That's how God made us. But don't let those emotions have you. And again, the Word of God is what 
brings you to that place where you realize, wait a minute, I've got, I've got this image in front of me. I see, I see that's, that's the problem right there, and it pinpoints it. Now <laughs> we need to be healed. And thank God we have a God who heals as the great physician. Because the Word of God delineates the emotional from the spiritual, penetrating the precise problem and propelling us to the one who can fix it, heal it. Psalm 107 verse 20, listen to this. He sent His Word and healed them, His Word, and delivered them from their destructions, His Word. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, there's a really fascinating account. I'll begin reading in verse 5. We're told, now, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to Him, pleading with Him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak the word, and my servant will be healed. Oh, for I also am a man under authority having soldiers under me. Centurion, they were over 100. Century 100 centurions. They had 100 people under them. And I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. In verse 13 we're told, Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way, and as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour spoke it. When you get to verse 16, we read, when evening came, many who were demon possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word, and healed all the sick. That is the power of the Word of God. It is sharp, perfect, decision. It'll pinpoint the problem, show you you, and where the problem is. And then, like James says, the law is perfect, a mirror that shows us that we've transgressed the law. Then here comes the Holy Spirit, takes us by the hand like a tutor at school, takes us by the hand. You've broken the law, you've transgressed, takes us to the Savior, who saves, who heals. I want to just mention one more thing before we move on to verse 14 and 15. As a pastor, one of the things, and this is, I am certainly capable of this, but I've watched over the years how pastors have given in and acquiesced, caved in to the pressure for lack of a better word, when it comes to God's Word. And by that I mean they've lost confidence in the power of God's Word. And what always ensues is now filler. You've got to come up with something because apparently you don't think that God's Word is relevant enough. You don't think that God's Word is powerful enough. So what are you going to do? Resort to gimmicks. You know what's really interesting is, 
as one said, it's the Word of God by way of the Spirit of God that ministers to the people of God. And when a pastor loses confidence in the Word of God, they have just negated the Spirit of God. And so what are you going to do? Well, now you've got to come up with a substitute. And you need look no further than to all of the things they have to do to keep the thing moving. Because it's, the Holy Spirit isn't moving. Why isn't the Holy Spirit moving? Because the Word of God is not preached. And so, and the people are not fed. So instead of the people being fed, the sheep being fed, now you have to entertain them. And if you want to entertain them, you're going to have to get smoke machines and free iPads and all the other stuff that goes along with it, just to keep their attention. I have to say, no pressure on me. It's not on me to keep and hold your attention. The Holy Spirit does that. I don't have to get up here and keep it going and keep it moving. And, you know, <laughs> first of all, I would be exhausted. I'm exhausted just thinking about it and talking about it. That's what the Holy Spirit does. If I'm faithful to preach the Word, the Holy Spirit now is free. And it's in the power of the Holy Spirit to reach that deep recess in your heart. Put the finger of God on that thing that's got to go. We need to get that out. We need spiritual surgery. When my firstborn son Elias was four years old, we noticed a lump on his stomach. And of course, the way I'm wired, I'm, I'm assuming the worst is, oh no, he's going to die. <laughs> You know how it is. We always manufacture the worst case scenario. So we take him into the doctor, and the doctor says, it's a hernia. I'm like, a hernia? He didn't start weightlifting till he was 16. How, do you, how does a four-year-old get a hernia? Well, he was what they call active alert. <laughs> That's an understatement. Anyway, he got a hernia. So he had to go in for surgery. And would you believe that I let the physician take a sharp instrument and cut into my son. <laughs> what kind of a father are you? No, I need to get that out and fix that up. So I have to let the great physician take the surgical instrument of his word. I know it cuts. It cut into me and get that thing out. That's what the Word of God does. The second one is in verses 14 and 15, and in addition to God's Word, it's God's compassion. Here the writer of Hebrews directs us to our great high priest, who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, who is the Son of God. Now you have to understand that he's writing to these Jewish believers that had come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And all their co-workers and family and friends were constantly on them, really persecuting them, trying to get them to go back to Judaism. The temple had not yet been destroyed. So on a daily basis, all of their friends would go into the temple. And one day a year, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. One day a year to make atonement, the high priest. And they were still observing this, and the high priest would go in to the temple before it was destroyed. And on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur day, Kippur atonement. And that high priest had to have no unconfessed sin. 
because he was entering into the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was, and as such, the Shekinah glory of God. And he goes in on that Day of Atonement, behind the veil. I wish you don't picture in your mind veil, but this was a thick curtain that separated the most holy place from the holy place. So one day a year he would enter in to the most holy place. And if he had unconfessed sin, he died. Listen, if you're anything like me, and I suspect that you are, I'm not going to volunteer for that. <laughs> really? Yeah. You're in the presence of God. It was so serious. Get this. They would tie a bell to his robe with a rope. So if they did not hear that bell ringing anymore, up, oh, pull him out. <laughs> Whoops. That was their high priest. Now imagine this, picture this with me. You've got these Jews putting pressure on these new Christians saying, where's your high priest? <laughs> oh, he's in heaven. Oh really? Wow. Your high priest is Jesus? Yeah. Well, what, look at our high priest. Look at our temple. Look at the most holy place. And this was a real thing for them. And this was a real hard thing for them. So the writer of Hebrews is wanting to encourage them and really in a sense redirect them and remind them, <laughs> your high priest is Jesus. And you know that thick curtain, some Bible commentators estimate that it was like 18 inches thick. That's thick. Forget veil. Picture veil is like a, you know, thin little thing. 18 inches thick. When Jesus resurrected from the dead, that thing was torn down the middle, and that place was open because Jesus became our great high priest. Now, he doesn't stop there, thankfully. The writer of Hebrews goes on to explain that Jesus empathizes with our weaknesses, and He tells us why. It's because Jesus Himself was tempted in every way that we are. But He didn't sin. And it's for this reason that Jesus has compassion for us, sympathizes with us, and is there for us, because He made atonement instead of us. It's done. No need. You want proof? Go look at that foot and a half thick curtain. It's torn. It's been torn. If you were to ask me what I thought was one of the most misunderstood characters, of God, this would have to be it. God even makes it very clear in the book of Exodus that He's compassionate and merciful and slow to anger, full of mercy, long-suffering. He's not angry. He took all of His anger, all of His wrath, and He put it on His only begotten Son on that cross that day. God is not angry with you. Maybe somebody needs to hear that today. He's not angry with you at all. He's not had it with you. <laughs> Get this. He even likes you. He likes me. Yeah. I mean, I stand up here and I say, God loves you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sadly, we live in a day where that doesn't mean much. The word love doesn't pack as much punch as the word like. When I hear that God actually likes me, 
Oh, that, he does? Wow. You mean he's not angry with me? No. He really likes me? Yeah. And he's compassionate towards you. He empathizes with you. He's long suffering. For some of us, it's longer suffering than others. You know what long suffering means, right? I know this is deeply profound. He suffers long. Right? He's <laughs> and that's all because of this third one in verse 16, where I want to spend the remainder of our time. In addition to God's Word and God's compassion, it's God's grace. It's all of grace, all of grace. I know that Hebrews 4.16 is a life verse for many. It is one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. And there's so much in just this one verse, and if you'll kindly allow me to, and just kind of bear with me, I really want to draw your attention to just this one verse and the implications of what the writer of Hebrews is saying. Now stay with me. I can approach, there's no barrier, there's no 18 inch barrier between me and Jesus, me and the presence of God. I have unfettered access to the God who created the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is, and I don't get voicemail. I'll give you a moment on that. I know it's the 4th of July. Think about that. I don't even need an appointment. Uh, I can get in to see him anytime. I, when I call, it's not, you know, voicemail. If I, if I text, you know those three dots? Right there. I have unfettered access to the throne, <laughs> to the throne. Let me see if I can bring it into earthly terms. What if you had access to a king or a queen and their throne at any time? <laughs> You'd be walking around going, oh, I know people in high places. <laughs> right? Well, that's nothing. <laughs> I know God Almighty, Most High God, we're like this. Get him on the phone. <laughs> Watch this. Speed dial. Boom. JD, how you doing? Hey, can you say hi to my friend? <gasps> no way! Way! I can approach His throne of grace, not with apprehension like, I don't know, but with confidence. Not arrogance, confidence. Not in myself, but in Him. I can confidently, boldly enter into His throne room anytime. And when I do, here's what happens. You know how it is when, well, as kids, when your parents say, well, you just wait till your dad gets home, and you, say, you know, I talk with you, or your boss as an employee, uh, they're calling you into their office, they need to talk to you. Oh no, that's it. You assume the worst, right? I'm fired. I just know I'm fired. And how nervous would you be? Let's just go back to our previous illustration of an earthly throne. Let's just say you were invited, you had audience with this, you know, figure, and you were able to enter into their throne and be in their presence. And the date was scheduled and the time was scheduled. You would be so nervous. Okay, what am I going to say? I'm going to enter in and, and uh, oh my goodness, you know who this is? The writer of Hebrews is saying, when you enter in to the throne of grace, you do so without apprehension, 
without hesitation, you're not going to get it. You're going to get it. What am I going to get? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. Mercy. I could use me some of that. And I'll find grace. I could use me some of that too. And help in my time of need. My time of need, anytime. I can access the throne of Almighty God. But I don't. Here I can at any time call upon Him, enter in. And when I do, I can find mercy and grace and help in my time of need. And I can do so confidently. Listen to what the Apostle John said in his first epistle, chapter 5, beginning in verse 14. This is the confidence, confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of Him. What? Anything? Yeah, it says anything. I don't know. What does it say in the original? Anything? (laughs) I'm not trying to be cute. And you mean I can, I can ask confidently, not sheepishly, like, Lord, I, I'm sorry to bother you. I know you're busy. You're really busy. You know, I've got a whole universe to run and got a lot of things going on, especially right now. So I'm sorry to bother you. And can I just, uh, you know, ask you for, not like that. He says, come on in. What do you need? Oh, I need, I need help. Oh, you came to the right place. You came to the right place. I, I, got a, I got this serious problem. I know I'm the one that showed you the, the problem and the x-ray. That's uh, on your phone. You can show it to your friends too. Yeah. yeah, this is pretty serious. Yeah, it is. Only you can help me. Will you let me? How about this? Will you ask me? And when you ask me, Know this, that I hear, and I will give you whatever it is that you ask me for. Why don't you just ask? James chapter 4, the second part of verse 2 says, you do not have because you do not ask. Well, that explains it. Okay, so why, and I'm going to ask you at this time to just allow the Holy Spirit to just put on your heart whatever that is that you need. Whatever it is that you brought to church with you today that you're struggling with or in need of, and heretofore you have not received. Have you asked? Have you even asked? So this answers the question of, oh, so I don't have because I didn't ask. So if I ask, that means I'll have. If it's according to God's will, you got it. I got another question. Why don't we ask? Answer, we don't believe. That's the problem. And even if we do ask, we won't ask for anything. We we were told anything. Just anything. What do you want? Anything. Anything. If it's good, here you go. But we won't ask for anything that we don't truly believe God would actually give us. In other words, we pray little prayers to a big God who is able to do the impossible if we would but believe. This centurion, man, we're going to see him in heaven, you know. And his healed servant too. You don't think that guy got saved? (laughs) He didn't just get healed physically, he got saved spiritually for all eternity. He said, all you got to do, 
I believe you can do it. In fact, you don't even have to come to my house. I mean, not, not that I don't want you to come. How cool would that be? Of course, again, how nervous would you be if Jesus says, hey, I'm going to be at your place for dinner. <gasps> you are? Where's Martha when you need her? <laughs> right? That's a whole other sermon. We won't even go there. All you have to do, I, I believe you can do anything. You do? Yeah. Watch me now. Watch. You believe that I can do this? <laughs> okay. Game on. Watch this. And he does it. And then even after he does the impossible, we're like, whoa, we still don't believe. I can't believe God did that. Well, you asked me to do it, and it was impossible, and I did it, and now, and now you don't believe it? Ask me anything. There's an interesting story that's told of Alexander the Great, while known for conquering the entire known world of his time. What's not so well known about him is that he was actually a very compassionate man, especially towards his people. As the story goes, he would set aside one day a year, and he called it Compassionate Day, in which he would randomly select people across his kingdom and allow them to ask the king for a special request that he would grant whatever it was. What's interesting is that most people would only ask for such things as food, clothes, money for medicine, and things like that. That is until one particular year when a peasant requested that he be given a big palace with a big banquet hall, so he could host big meals for all of his friends. To the astonishment of all present that day, Alexander the Great granted his request. When the king's men asked him why he would grant this man's extravagant request, I mean, the, the nerve of this guy, What's the matter with you? Everybody else just says, hey, can you just pay my rent? Whatever. No, I want a mansion. I want a palace. Big banquet hall, custom design. I'll give you the blueprints. I want to have big meals. Because you said anything. Yes, I did. God, that's what I want then. Okay. Done. Why did you give it to him? Why did you grant his request? You know what Alexander the Great's response was? He told them that all the people were asking for mundane things. They could just ask anyone to give them. They don't need a king to give them such things. Anyone with extra goods or resources could do that. But a king, for the first time, this man has made me feel like the king I am. For only a king could grant such a request. I wonder, I, I don't want to take this too far, but I want you to think this through with me. I wonder what could have been ours if we would have but asked and believed. Here's God who loves us so much, at the ready, willing to give us anything. If we would just ask and believe, I'll give it to you, anything you want. I love you so much. I'll give you anything you want, anything, anything. And then we come. It's like this. Okay, JD is getting ready to pray. He's going to ask me for something. Gabriel, Michael, get over here. Come on, you guys, get ready. He's coming. Here he goes. Whatever he asks, give it to him. 
And so here I come. Father in heaven, bless this meal and uh, bless it to our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. Ugh. Okay, you can go back. Um, we got another meal prayer. Where's that? Right? Here I would have, I would have given you. Think about it like this as earthly parents. I mean, Jesus even talking about the Holy Spirit said, you know, as earthly parents, if your children come to you and ask you for a fish, you're not going to give them a snake, would you? <laughs> if you I see me afterwards if you would do that. Or, or bread, would you give them a stone? How much more your heavenly Father will give you whatever you ask Him for? In fact, I picture God just wanting so much to give us so much. And He's just waiting. Everything we need, whatever we have need of, is right here. Just come and ask me for it, and believe me for it, and I'll give it to you. It's waiting, it's collecting dust. Not that there's dust in heaven, but get the, you get the point. It's just, just waiting here for you. Just ask me for it, and I'll give it to you. One of the things I'm learning about my own prayer life personally, is that God doesn't say, I've got to pray. He compassionately reminds me that I get to pray. It's a get to, not a got to. Again, think about it as earthly parents, even grandparents. What if your children, grandchildren came to you and said, I've got to spend time with, you know, yeah. I've got to spend time with mom and dad or grandfather and grandmother. You know what? Don't bother. It's going to be like that. You got to? That's okay. No, I get to. Well, that's different. That's what prayer is. God never says, pray, because I'm God, and I said so. <laughs> Could you imagine? So He ever so gently and compassionately and patiently leads us and brings us to the end of our resources and the end of ourselves in the realm of the natural. So we're left with no other choice but to turn to Him in the supernatural. Again, one of the things I'm learning in my own walk with the Lord is that when it's still possible for me, it's impossible for God. It's like hands off to God, because I'm still trying to do it in my own strength, in and of my own self. I got this, God. Okay. I'll be here when you're done for the 9,523rd time. And when you come to the end of yourself, you come to me and I'll of course, by then you've made a horrendous mess of the thing. <laughs> I mean, why is it that, and God, again, so gracious, so compassionate, so merciful, He just waits until it's impossible. And then we come to Him, God, this is impossible. <laughs> To which I could almost hear the Lord saying, well, it's about time. I made it impossible, so you'd come to me, because I'm the God of the impossible. And you wouldn't come to me when it was still possible for you. If it's possible for you, it's impossible for me. Because see, if it's still possible for you, and you do it, you get the glory for it, not me. And no flesh is going to glory in my presence. I'm going to make this thing so utterly ridiculous and it's impossibility, so that when I do it, it will be unmistakable. Even if you wanted to try to take the credit for it, <laughs> it will be laughable. Abraham and Sarah, she's 90, he's 100. 
angel of the Lord, it was actually a Christophany, the Lord Himself appears to Abraham, says, one year from the day you're going to have a son. <laughs> God, that's, that's impossible. That's a very old prayer request, Lord, on my, a very old prayer list. Uh, for <laughs> In fact, we got Ishmael over here. God doesn't recognize Ishmael, a type of the flesh. He says, now I'm going to do it. Yeah, but Sarah's, you know, she's no spring chicken anymore. That womb has been long ago closed and barren. It's impossible. Oh, really? Watch me now. You know what the name Isaac means? Of course you do. In Hebrew it's Yitzhak. In Arabic, my native tongue, it's Yitzhak. It literally means laughter, laughing, laughable. If I were to say to you in Arabic, Ana yitzhak ma'akum, I'm saying I'm laughing with you. This is laughable. That's what his name is. You, met, you know, in school, roll call, you know, Zachariah here, laughter here, <laughs> you know. That was his name. That's what it meant. The name was the nature. It meant laughable. Because it was laughable that a 90-year-old woman could give birth to a biological son. Not with God. With God all things are possible. When Jesus was asked about the impossibility of anyone being saved, His response in Matthew 19.26 was, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. When Mary questioned the angel of the Lord, who told her that she would give birth as a virgin to the Savior of the world, He told her in Luke 137, with God nothing will be impossible. And then the aforementioned Abraham and Sarah. When Sarah laughed after Abraham was told, that she would give birth to a son at 90 years of age, well past childbearing age. In Genesis 18.14, Abraham is asked by the Lord this rhetorical question, is anything too hard for the Lord? I want to close this way. Whatever that situation is in your life, <laughs> it's brought you to your face before the Lord. It's a good thing. You're looking at this situation and there's no way. No way. There is a way. Yeah, but this is impossible. Oh really? Perfect. Because we serve a God who does the impossible. Why don't you just ask Him? No, oh, come on. He's not going to give me a big palace with a big banquet hall so I can <laughs> have all my friends come over. And How do you know? No, it's impossible. There's no way. And then for you to think that He would do that for you? What's the matter with you? Not you, me. I'm actually talking to me. <laughs> I'll never forget that phone call to the realtor, who was two weeks away from listing 3.1 acres at 47525 Cam Highway. I called him up, introduced myself, I didn't know this at the time. I just said, hey, um, is this property for sale? I had seen it years ago when we were still at the old building, but it was leasehold. It wasn't fee simple. And it wasn't even for sale anyway. So I thought, well, no way. Not interested anyway. So I called him. I said, is it, is it still leasehold? He said, no, we took care of all of that. It's fee simple. I said, oh, really? I said, you know, I, I, uh, is it for sale? He said, well, interesting you should call. 
we're just getting ready to list it, because we've cleared up all of the leases, all of the legal entanglements, all of the financial issues, and we're going to put it up for sale. I said, no need. It's, it's one of those things where after you say it, you think, I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> I said, you don't need to list it, because we'll buy it. By the way, how much is the sale price? <laughs> no, right? I'm going somewhere, just bear with me. I'm almost done. I haven't said one last thing yet, so. He said, well, five million. I said, okay, well, we'll, we'll take it. Do, don't list it, we'll take it. So we set up a time and came out with the board and a few of the leaders. And <laughs> I have the pictures to prove it, by the way. You could not even walk in this thing. It was, there were syringes, and I'm sorry for this, condoms and clothes and drugs and all kinds of stuff in this thing. And it was, I would suggest a Nat's eyebrow, and yes, Nat's have eyebrows, <laughs> away from condemnation, complete teardown. It was in that much of a state of disrepair. And I even remember, how laughable is this? We walk into this thing, and the stench and the water, it wasn't leaking, the water was pouring in. And you can even walk in some places and just full of rubbish. And I remember the board going, what did you get us into? <laughs> what have we done? You already bought it? Well, we're negotiating. Are you kidding me? This is laughable. This is impossible. I said, perfect. Watch what God's going to do now. I tell you, you're sitting in a miracle. You're sitting in the impossible, because God is the God of the impossible. You know, after we got the church, I would get phone calls and even emails from would-be buyers that are like, you bought it? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> How'd you do that? I didn't. God did. We're going to put a church there. We were going to put a shopping center there. We were waiting for them to list it. I said, <laughs> thank you, Lord. <laughs> God's timing is perfect. Only God could do that. Now here's, here's what, I, what I was wanting to say. I asked God, I'm not, please, don't look at me like, well, Pastor J.D., we're not worthy. I know he's a, such a man of faith. If you only knew, don't talk to my wife. All of the times I was curled up in the fetal position, moaning. That's the man of faith I was. Oh God, <laughs> what have I done? Just during the building process, what I didn't realize is God was building us, building our faith not just a building. But I remember distinctly this, this pivotal point where I just said, okay, God, I'm going to ask you for this, and I'm going to believe you for this. And it was almost like I untied the hands of God's miraculous blessings. And it was like, did you just believe me to do this? And yeah. Did you just really ask me for 3.1 acres at 47525 Cam Highway? Yeah. All right. Watch what I'm going to do. And oh, by the way, I'm going to do it. Don't try to help me out. I don't need you. In fact, you want to help me? Don't help me. Stay out of my way. Because when this is all said and done, there's no way you're going to take any of the credit for it. It's going to be laughable. People are going to walk in and say, that's your pastor? Yeah. How did you get? We didn't. No, it wasn't him. It wasn't them. It wasn't us. It was him. He did it. He did it. How, what, we just asked, and he gave it to us. We believed that he could, and he did. You know what's? Okay, this will be the last thing. This is important. This is the the, the Holy Spirit, I believe. You know what's really sad? 
Is the word faith community and false teaching of the name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, that has done more damage to the body of Christ than I would argue any other false teaching. Because we've thrown the proverbial baby out with the bathwater, as they say. We don't want to get anywhere close to this, hey, I'm going to believe God. I'm just going to believe God for big things and, and have faith that God can do it. We don't want to be labeled with them or looked at like them. And so we've gone to the opposite extreme. And we don't ask for anything. We don't believe God for anything. I'll never forget, we, a visiting pastor of another Calvary Chapel on the East Coast was here a couple years ago now. And uh, great guy. Uh, Ken Graves, Calvary Chapel, Bangor, Maine. And uh, we went out to see the Bobby Benson uh, Center up here. And so when he was at the church, he wanted to, uh, to see it. He was just blown away. And he made this comment to me, I'll never forget it. He said, you know, JD, this, you don't see this very often. You might see it with the word faith guys, but not necessarily with the Calvary chapels that would have the audacity to ask for this? No way. Come on. You know, we were a small church. We were nobody. We were nobody. We, I, I mean, probably when we got this building, we might have been maybe 150 people. And, we, and even other churches wanted this place. Nah, 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 nah. Nah, was, uh, better not do that. But we believed God by faith, and we asked. We went to that throne room confidently, not hesitantly, not apprehensively, confidently. And we appealed to a loving God who wants to help us. And what we found was mercy and grace and help in our time of need. And we ask. Why don't you stand? We'll have the worship team come up. I'll close this in song. I'll close in prayer. Thank you for your patience. I know it's Independence Day. You don't want to get back to, I can't believe you're even here, actually. I was thinking, nobody's going to come. It's going to be me and my family and uh, the worship team. <laughs> so I'm glad you're here. Let's pray. Father in heaven, You are so good, God. You're just so good. Lord, thank You that we can come to You anytime, for anything, and ask You. And if it glorifies You, we can have that which we ask for. Lord, I pray for anyone here today that just needed a word fitly spoken, needed to be reminded that you want to help, that you are compassionate, that you can do the impossible. Lord, I pray that you will do it. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, Amen.